name is Matthew James Vincent. Go by Matt. Really never give my name much thought, but does anyone love their name? Tyrone, you've lo you love your name. Just because? It's a good icebreaker. Okay. Anyone hate their name? John Williams, you hate your name? It's a good name. Okay. We're going to rename John after the service. So those with prophetic gifts, start thinking of good names. Um, so I never really thought much about my name. It's just kind of what it was. And then when Bobby and I first discovered we were going to have kids, then you start thinking about names in a serious way. You start kind of working it through. So what name should we pick? And there's a lot of like positive things that can come up. You have positive associations with maybe grandparents or distant family members or friends, and you're like, oh, I just love that name because it's connected to someone that you have a positive association with. And then there's also, like, if we're honest, probably some names that you're like, there's not a chance I'm using that name because of just like the anger and angst it stirs up for you. So like, I had this nemesis in grade two named Ian, so there's no way I was using the name Ian. And then in grade five, there's this girl named Bridget who drove me crazy so like those two names were definitely not on the list and as you can tell I've healed well from my like pain of uh, primary school but when we're thinking about names we kind of associate with either family or characteristics some of us look up the root of the name where does it come from what does it actually mean I'm not sure if you've done this if you don't have your own children maybe you have a pet and you've thought long and hard about what you want to name you know your turtle or something I don't know but names have like a, mean a meaning and association because for us they stir up a sense of identity and a sense of uh, uh, something more than just the letters on the page. What does a name mean? What is behind a name? So a couple months ago, I don't know how I came across this, I saw that um, the girl who was on Suits, who married the prince, what's her name? May, uh, Meghan Markle, they were having their baby, and there was all this talk about like the royal family and how they pick names. So I was reading this article about like something about the name has to tie to the historical past, like tie back to King Henry, so there's like been seven Henrys, or I don't know, something like that. And and the royal family also, if I'm understanding correctly, has this thing where they want the name to be accessible to the modern, modern culture. John, you're, you're British. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But so it doesn't seem too snooty, right? So they want it to be historically rooted, but also make sense for today's age for the people. Uh, and the queen mom, I think, has to approve the name before it's uh, released to the public. I'm not sure if that's all true. <coughs> but this sense of naming and trying to figure it out and wrestle it through. And then, then I... <coughs> Then I got in this weird zone of looking up like crazy names. And I remember when Chris Martin and Gwyneth Paltrow named their kid Apple, they like sparked this, oh man, there's like some crazy names going on. And so I dug out like, you know, I go down these rabbit trails, but Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, like their kids are named North, Saint, and Chicago. You guys know that? Emily for sure knew that, right? Yeah, you did. I knew what you did. Um, <clears throat> and I just started looking at others. So does anyone know who Frank Zappa is? Yeah, like this, oh, yeah, awesome, Brian. So you and I, um, so uh, Frank Zappa, he ha his, this is his kids, Moon Unit, uh, Dwizil, and Diva Thin Muffin are the three names of his now adult kids. He's passed away. You know, Blue Ivy is Jay-Z and Beyonce. Then I found this one. Does anyone know whose kid this is? Pilot Inspector. Jason Lee, the actor Jason Lee. Just this weird thing where you look at names and, People pick them for a whole variety of reasons, and I think our Google Home was listening to me because then on my search engine stuff started coming up about names and ancestry.ca all of a sudden. I don't know how, like it hears you and then it starts coming up, and so I started doing, I started clicking on ancestry.ca up until the point where they ask for like a credit card number because they like bait you into like learning about who you are. Um, and they just talk about the origin of names and that why people would, their names would historically been, then been added with a descriptor of where they came from or what their occupation was and all this stuff around names. All this stuff around names. And today we're talking about who God is. And it's going to be a really, really uh, weird and difficult one for us to tackle. But one of the ways we're going to try to explore who God is is by looking at the names of God that we find in Scripture. So as you read the Bible, what are the different names that are given for who God is? So we're going to get that in a second. But what I first want you to do is just spend a moment. We've done this the last couple of weeks. Circle up, turn to your neighbor, whatever you like, and just say, who is God? Oh, don't say that. Ask each other that and then answer it. Uh, who is God? How would you describe God? I'm going to give you just two minutes. Do it real quick. Just get us thinking, get everyone involved. Who is God or how would you describe God? Okay? Talk to each other. Go for it.
tell me what you were talking about or what your definition or explanation was. Uh, anyone, just jump out. How would you describe God? Who is God? What would you say if someone asked you as you're sitting across the table, who is God? Yeah, Theo. Love. God is love. Okay, awesome. What else? Creator. Creator. Shut it out. Don't be shy. Yeah, Tammy. The essence of wholeness? Holiness. Holiness. Yeah. Thank you. What else? A couple more. I always think of a, Savior? I always think of a gem that you can't see all of it all at once. A gem. That's always what comes to mind. Okay. John doesn't like his names, but he's very deep. <clears throat> John the Deep, we will call him from now on. <clears throat> Just call him Deep. <laughs> yeah, Dave. It's a great comment here. <coughs> all the words we use, they don't, there's not enough words to do justice. Yes, the comment is of all the words or all the attempts we have to describe, nothing feels like it does its justice. Awesome. I think that is really, that's a really good comment, and it moves, let's, let's move off of that. I think it's like one of those things where we try our best to articulate and put into words this concept that somehow just feels beyond our ability to comprehend. So how do we really describe who God is? What does that even look like? How do we, from our Christian worldview, we believe that God has created us. We're talking about that next Sunday, the creation kind of story. But we believe that God has created us. So how does the being that has been created describe the creator? How do we even do that? And so we've tried our best over the centuries of trying to describe who God is. And we're going to specifically looking at different accounts through the, from the Bible different snapshots, different ways of trying to tackle this. And we're going to start with talking about names of God. Then we're going to talk about characteristics. We're going to talk about the Trinity. We're going to talk about, does God have a gender? All these things. And we're going to have to uh, fly pretty quickly through this. Um, so let's get started here on the names of God. So let me just walk through a couple really quick from the Old Testament. So in the very beginning of your Bible, the book of Genesis, the fourth word in, it says, so uh, in the beginning, God, fourth word, and that Hebrew word is Elohim. I'm sure you all know that, Elohim, but that is the, the word, the Hebrew word used for uh, what we translate as God. It appears in the Old Testament like 2,600 times, over that actually. So it's this really common Hebrew word to describe God. And we gather that he was before everything that was created. Again, next week we're talking more about that. But when you translate that Hebrew word, Elohim, this is what it means. First off, it's a plural word, and it means divine one, God, rulers. So over and over the, in the Hebrew scripture, when they're talking about God, they use this word Elohim, divine one, God, rulers. So it's the one who is kind of before all these things, all these things we're trying to describe and get our heads around. When we say God, that's the one we're talking about, the one who is beyond this. <clears throat> then if you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 3, we find this really interesting story. Where this guy named Moses is uh, just hanging out, doing his own thing, looking after some flocks, and he notices this burning bush. And uh, if you know the story, so he approaches this burning bush that doesn't seem to be consumed by the fire. And as he approaches it, he hears this voice coming from the fire. The voice says, take off your sandals, because where you're standing is holy ground. And so he does, and he approaches this bush. And God then, through this fire and this burning bush, gives Moses these instructions. He's, he's going to be kind of commissioning Moses for this task of going to the Pharaoh of Egypt and demanding that the nation of Israel be released from slavery. So Moses is given this specific task, and he questions back, and he says, well, if they ask me who's sending me or by whose authority I'm doing this, what shall I say? So let me read this for you, this little section. This is from Exodus 3, beginning at 13, verse 13. Uh, but Moses protested, <clears throat> if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? What then should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. So Moses kind of pushes in, like, who should I say is giving me this task? God replies, just tell them I am 
who I am. Oh, makes sense, right? I am who I am. So this is how my childish mind works. When I was reading that and thinking about it, I thought about this uh, 911 phone call that was going around a number of years ago. You may not have heard it. Let me explain it. So the 911 operator comes on and says, 911, what's your emergency? And this lady says, I'd like to report a drunk driver. And the 911 operator says, okay, which direction is the car headed? And uh, the lady replies, oh, heading towards this town. And so he's taking note of that. I don't know the name of the town. <clears throat> and then the 911 operator says, uh, ma'am, are you behind them? Like, are you following this drunk driver? And then the lady replies, oh, no, I am them. And the operator pauses, says, you am them? And she replies, yes, I am them. And he says, are you the drunk driver, ma'am? And she says, yes, I am them. And then the phone call goes on, and she basically gets herself arrested and charged with impaired driving. But it feels like one of those things. Moses is like, who should I tell them? I am that I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's easy. I am that I am. So what, like, that just feels to me like a little bit of a I am them kind of comment. It just feels so strange, so weird. But then if you read the next section, it roots it in the history of the nation of Israel, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, the one who is before all these things. And as we've talked about, the God who invites his people into relationship through Abraham and his descendants, that God who is before everything, the God who existed before, exists now, and who exists ever, I am, I am that one. God is calling that out from his people and through Moses. And then the most popular name for God is this uh, name called Yahweh. So really, strictly ancient Jewish people and even uh, Orthodox Jews today would not say the name Yahweh because they would say it's too holy to be fully uh, articulated or even written. So they just refer to it as the name. But the name Yahweh appears more than 600 times in Scripture and is directly connected to the goodness and mercy of God. So in all these at attempts, Elohim for God, I am that I am, and Yahweh, we're trying to get this picture of a name that transcends time, transcends our own understanding, the God who was before, the God who is here, the God who will be after us, the one. When you speak of why is this all this way or how did this all get here, whatever that stirs in us, it's that one. That's who we're trying to talk about. And we're trying our best to try to grab and wrestle with it. Other names found in scripture, I have a little list here that might be familiar for you. <coughs> names of God, uh, God Most High, there we go, Everlasting God, Almighty, God Almighty, Lord Almighty, Lord God Almighty, Mighty One, Lord God, Rock, Anointed One, Advocate, Spirit. So, so those are some of the terms and names of God that we'd find as we read through the Bible. Different ways we're trying to uh, grasp and understand when we say who God is, we we go for a sense of a name, right? We do that. We name God. Um, in the Christian uh, tradition, whenever we say God, we are referring to this one. I am that I am. The God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. The God we read of through the Hebrew scriptures. The God that is then most fully present and reveals himself in Jesus. That's in a few weeks from now. How is it that Jesus comes as a man but is fully God? How does that all work? We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But Jesus, we'd believe, is the perfect representation and picture of who God is. So we may have these names, but when we want to see, like, who is God really, we can read and look at the teachings of Jesus and say, that is the full representation of who God is. So we'll get to that more. Then we have this really interesting thing. If you uh, kind of dig in through Scripture and talk about who God is, there's this concept um, known as the Trinity. So the way the math works here works this way. It's like one plus one plus one. <clears throat> equals one. That's the idea. So you may have heard the terms like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, different kind of terms we would talk about. So wait, God the Father, God the Son, does that equal Jesus? And then the Holy Spirit, which is the advocate and the one Jesus says to his followers at the end of the gospel accounts, I will send one to be with you, the Holy Spirit. So how does... How does that actually work? Is it three separate gods? Is it one God, three different representations? Were they actually all God? The early church in the first century was debating a whole bunch of these things, different kind of theories and heresies and different things came out. And, uh, and this is one way they drew it. There's a, 
a diagram here, Nate, if you could bring it up. <coughs> so this is kind of one of the ways that the church has tried to think about what the Trinity really looks like. So God, we're talking about God, and God is the Father, God is the Spirit, God is the Son, but the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, the Father is not the Son. Make sense? We're going to talk about this when we, uh, in a few weeks as well. I'm just like, that's my way of saying I don't, I don't want to talk about it now. It's too hard for me to understand. We're just going to, I just keep throwing it to a different week when someone else is going to teach. So, uh, <clears throat> so we have this concept of the Trinity. I want to mention it because it's an important thing when we talk about who God is to understand that when we try to get our minds around who God is and understand that, that there's different expressions of who God is that we see as we read through the Bible different ways of understanding. So we have the names, and then we have these different ways it plays itself out that also contributes to our sense of, okay, how does that fit and help shape our understanding of who God is? The Trinity, and why was that important to the early church, and why did they wrestle with that, all these different modes of understanding? All God. So yeah, so let's just leave that for now. Then we talk, sometimes when we talk about God, I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, the dominant language and pronouns and descriptors are all seem to be male. So it could be easy to think of, well, God is like a guy then, I guess. Um, God the Father. A lot of the characteristics seem to be like male kind of characteristics, uh, talking about like might and power and battle and things like that. And uh, I definitely grew up in a tradition where I, I guess I just kind of always thought that I don't know if I would have said, I think God's a guy, but it felt like we never talked about anything other than that. And so I want to do is I think just for the sake of balance is to show you that while the Bible is full of male imagery and pronouns, there's also a lot of female characteristics and pronouns that show up in different ways throughout scripture. It's not an equally weighted thing, but it does happen. I want to just show you a number of these um, if you want to look up the accounts, like I just didn't want to throw up a whole bunch of titles and names and just say, trust me, they're there. I felt like you should actually see this. So if you want to take a picture of it or whatever and look them up for yourself, because this may be new to some of you. It may be new to you to hear God described in terms or characteristics that feel more feminine, but they are there in scripture. So we have the female homemaker, a baker woman, seamstress, midwife, uh, God discovered as both mother and father, master and mistress. Uh, God described as a comforting mother, uh, the Godhead described as a birthing mother, the womb of God is talked about, nursing, fierce mother bear, female pelican, mother eagle. So there are these like female descriptors that um, scripture has that helps us try to, again, round out our understanding of who God is. So we think, now this, you know, in some sections of the church, this whole list that I threw up there, and even what we're talking about right now, is uh, super scandalous and out of bounds because it feels like it pushes into territory that's not fair. But I think what is fair is for us to say that God exists outside of our defined sense of gender. God is neither male nor female. God has created male and female, created us all in his image, which again is next week in the creation account. We are all bear the image of the divine. And while scripture for various reasons was written primarily with male-dominated language and metaphors and pronouns, It's not exclusive. And so I think sometimes the church has done a disservice to the women in our midst to force on you this idea that God must be this man. And God's not a man. Scandal? Everyone's leaving? No one will be back next week? Okay, let me just keep going for the sake of time. But I invite you to check out some of those things. So God not defined in terms of gender. (coughs) Then, so we have names we talked about. We breezed by the Trinity, talked about gender. Let me just talk about one more thing, characteristics. So sometimes when we go to get to know someone, we can use characteristics that give us a rounding off or a a more fuller picture of a person by describing them using different, um, is that an adjective when you use a word to describe? Is that right? Adjectives. So I think these are adjectives. I just said characteristics because I... I don't know what the right word is. So I just say characteristics. So here's a whole bunch that you can find. Uh, I didn't put the references on this one, but I have them all if you want them. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, So uh, let me just read these quick. And in bold, I put ones that feel uh, non-positive. So angry, benevolent, compassionate, constant, eternal, everywhere, faithful, free, gentle, genuine, good, gracious, holy, impartial, infinite, 
jealous, just, all-knowing, life, light, love, merciful, one, patient, persistent, personal, powerful, present, regretting, righteous, sovereign, spirit, testing, truth, unsearchable, unseen, vengeful, wise. So I'm sure there's a lot more. But in a couple of the books I was reading, these, I was just jotting down this list, and this list is what popped up here. So sometimes we use, you can leave that up actually, Nate. Sometimes we use characteristics, adjectives, uh, to help us again. This is our attempt to try to get our minds around the idea of like, so who is God? What is God? What is this all about? So um, these things can help us because as we're reading different sections of scripture, sometimes it, it stands out to us that like, oh, God is merciful. We read these stories or these accounts and we see that God demonstrates mercy or goodness, compassion, whatever it may be. So, <clears throat> Keely, I see you looking at your watch. Am I late? You're checking me. What time is it? 10 after 9. Okay, it's 10 after. It's okay. You can like be like, hurry up, hurry up. So, I'm going to hurry up. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pause right here. I think this is probably a good place to pause. I've been like throwing a whole bunch of ideas out to you. And some of them may feel new. Some of them may feel, oh, yeah, like a reminder, something you've thought about before. Some of them may feel puzzling. But I'd like you just to talk about it. Talk about these ideas that we've tossed out, these names for God, characteristics for God, concept of Trinity, um, gender, any of those things that are maybe getting your mind spinning a little bit when we have this concept or this conversation, what or who is God. I would like you to talk about that with each other, and I want to hear what you're thinking. And if you have questions, we can maybe talk about it. But I just want to uh, respond and hear what we're thinking as, we, as we're sitting in this moment of trying to describe God and feeling like we just are failing at doing it. How do we get our minds around it? Okay? Take a couple minutes, maybe three or four minutes. It'll be quick. But talk about these, like, things that I've tossed out to you. Okay? Go for it. So what are we talking about? Theo, you want to jump in? <clears throat> Quay. Right. So, the, so you're saying that <clears throat> if we see a characteristic demonstrated by, say, Jesus, does that mean that's also a characteristic of when you say God, you're talking about like God the Father is what you're referring to? Yeah, that's what you're getting at, right? So <clears throat> I guess different people would uh, approach that in different ways. Our tradition would say, yes, everything you see in Jesus is, is a part of the essence of who God is. So we believe that Jesus is fully divine. So there's this... Um, this is, there was this heresy in the first century church called modalism. And it talked about God being, uh, existing in different modes and that God wasn't, f Jesus wasn't fully God. He was kind of empowered by God to do certain things, but he wasn't really. It was a different mode. And we, the early church, and we also would say that we don't believe that. We believe that in, in Jesus, we see a perfect picture of God. Jesus was fully divine. So <clears throat> it's interesting though, because certain characteristics say of Jesus, you brought up humility, did you say? we may associate, say, with uh, our understanding of who Jesus is, but it doesn't seem to fit our understanding of who we think God the Father is. I would push back and say, why is that? I would say, why is it that characteristics of who we think Jesus, or the characteristics that represent Jesus feel out of step with our understanding of God? I think that's actually the question. Why is there a dissonance? Uh, not that... It makes it easy, but I think that's where the wrestling needs to happen. So why do we believe them to be incongruent? And I think that would probably speak more to um, the foundations we have from growing up in our understanding of who God is, where we uh, have a dominant view of God in maybe more strong, aggressive terms. And so the, the breakdown feels like, but Jesus wasn't maybe those things, right? So why, anyways, I'd love to talk more about that. It's a great question. But we would say, no, Jesus is fully divine. Any characteristics we'd see would be the same for understanding of God. Yeah, they're not separate things. They're together. God is, the, the Father is the Son, is the Spirit from that diagram. <clears throat> yeah, what else?
yeah. So how do you, when you defer to all the time, why we like that? Like, what do you think? Sorry, did Stephanie, did you say why? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think if we step back, it can make sense. So the Bible was crafted in a time where it was, um, you know, males were dominating in society and culture. It was written primarily, like, as a way of uh, expression of the culture coming out of that culture. We see that all through there, um, written by men. Um, I think what's happened is we've allowed the fact that there's so many, like, male adjectives and descriptions of God to then equal who God is, rather than having context. So I would say... Yeah, like there was way more male-dominated language in the scripture. Jesus did come. He was born as a human male. But that doesn't mean then that God equals male. I think that we've just absorbed all those things because we've never talked about it in any other way. And honestly, I alluded to before, I never really thought about it before. And then I've started thinking about a lot more of these things over the years, more recent years, especially as I became a, a dad to girls too. And started recognizing how our language sometimes can be so limiting or I'm not, I'm not trying to say oppressive, but it may be in some cases where it shuts down conversations or people's sense of identity and worth because they are a different gender. And I would say, I think God exists beyond gender. I don't think he's limited by that. I think gender is an expression of God's creative act of which we are all image bearers of God. So I, <clears throat> yeah, for some people, it really matters. <laughs> some people really, really matters. Like, There'd be some traditions that if I was saying this, like, next week you would have someone else here. One of those kinds of things. But to me, like, maybe to us in the way we have conversations, why does it matter? Why would we be so fixated that God has to be a man? Again, what would be rooted? Why, where's that coming from? What power is behind that, our sense of hanging on? Rather than saying, like, what if God is beyond all those things? Yeah. Um, Chris. Yeah, where does our language fall short? Um, so uh, we sing this song here, Good, Good Father. The good, good father, who you are. You know, that one. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and that's fine. It's not a problem to sing because we see characteristics of, of God being father in scripture. So it's, it's okay to sing those things. But it should also be okay for us. Scandal, here we He's a, oh, she's a good, good mother. It's who you are. It's who, is that okay? How many people did like butt clenches as I did that? Because it feels like, oh, like heresy, heresy police, right? How, maybe we're not posting this video. But how many people, you know, for the three people who kind of start watching it and then get bored. Uh, so we're actually going to sing at the end, she's a good, good mother. And it's, it's going to be so weird for some of you. Let's just acknowledge that. But I think the question is, why is it so weird? Why do we have God locked into a box? I think you're so right. Did Chris leave at me singing that? Oh, I went too far. Um, so we're going to try that. We're going to try that. It, it's not to say it's not a right or wrong thing. It's to like open our minds that there's more than what we've been kind of our own uh, conceptions of what theology looks like, our study and understanding of who God is, that God is beyond our ability to use words to describe. That's <clears throat> the shack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, God the Father was um, the Octavia Spencer character, 
And Jesus was like the uh, Jesus character? Was he a guy? A handyman. And then the Holy Spirit was uh, an Asian woman, yeah. correct? Yeah, so some of us have read that book. Some of us have seen that movie. Some people in the church, like, freaked out about the idea of mixing that up that way. Yeah. I, yeah, it's good. I think it challenges our, our thinking in a good way. It doesn't, I don't think it should freak us out. I don't think it should scare us. Uh, one of the challenges with this topic today is, like, I'm like, how do you end this topic? Like, because there's no way of summing this up. I feel like this whole conversation is a dot, 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 and we got to keep talking and keep learning, and even then, we don't know. Um, but I have my best attempt to sum it up. Keely, how's our time? Oh, yeah, we better move on. Sorry, there's lots more to talk about. I'd love to talk with you later about this idea, but can I just sum it up? Because I felt like I want to give us something to go away from, and maybe there's already been enough that gets you talking this week or uh, around your tables or, you know, whatever. But I want to sum up this up, and Theo actually jumped on it, which I think is really, really cool. That whole list of characteristics uh, of who God is, sometimes we make those as equal. So God is this, but he's also this, but he's also this, he's also this, and they all have the same weight. And there's a guy named John Wesley, who is a leader of the Methodist Church, uh, which was like this revival that came out of the Church of England in the 1700s. And he talked about this pursuit of holiness and inner transformation and change and the grace of God. And he centers that whole around, the whole idea around the love of God. That we would say God is love and all those other characteristics and impressions and ideas of who we have, uh, that we have of God all stem out of God is love. God is love, period. And then all of our best attempts to describe all flow out of that central understanding. So Wesley said this. He said, it is not written God is justice or God is truth, although he is just and true in all his ways. But it is written... God is love. So 1 John 4, a couple verses in this section. Uh, part of your homework this week, we'll be reading this in more uh, detail, but here's a couple sections from 1 John chapter 4. It says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then in verse 16 and 17, he continues, uh, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And we live in God, and sorry, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So all the characteristics, all the ideas, this conversation on gender, uh, names of God found in Old Testament scripture, Elohim, Yahweh, <clears throat> all these things, it's great to talk about. But at the end of the day, what if we land on this idea and just embrace that we don't know all that there is to know about who God is. But what we do know as revealed in Jesus, and as we read scripture in the New Testament church, God is love. Stanley Gretz, who's a theologian, says this. He says, love is the fundamental divine attribute. Love is not merely one attribute of God among many. Rather, God is love is the foundational ontological statement we can declare discerning, uh, concerning the divine essence. <coughs> so here's what we're going to do. Oh, I want to show some homework. Um, I don't know if anyone did this this week, but I'm going to throw out some things that you can keep chewing on or thinking about. So on the homework slide, some of, I mentioned the Bible Project last week as some helpful tools and videos. Uh, there's, a, there's another one specifically called Who is the God of the Bible? So check that one out. It does, it's, I think it's about six minutes long. It does a good, good um, it's a good version of kind of summing up some of these ideas or getting you thinking a little bit about this. We'll post this as well. And now what I'd love you to spend some time in the same kind of rhythmic way is go to 1 John 4, read from 7 to 21. And the idea is that pray before you read that God would reveal himself to you. Trust that God wants to get to know us, cares about you, loves you, wants to reveal himself. And then spend some time reading through this. <coughs> Reflect and journal. Write down things that catch your mind. If there's a person or an idea or circumstance that comes to mind at, seemingly out of nowhere, journal that down. Why did that come to mind? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's something. And I'll list a few questions for you as well to consider uh, that flow out of this talk this morning. And use that as a way of having conversations with a friend who's here or 
a loved one or family, whatever you want, but we'll let you know. Uh, I want to give you something to keep you thinking and talking about this on who is God. And next week we're back talking about creation account. So it'll be going to be really good. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to come around the table. Uh, Am and crew, come on up. We're going to sing, uh, she's a good, good mother. I, I edited the words, um, but I forgot to put she. So it still probably says he's a good, good mother. So can we just like in our minds switch that? Um, unless like the internet police have already deleted our slide off there. Who knows? Uh, but we have communion here. And uh, as followers of Jesus today, as we come around the table, it's our weekly reminder of who Jesus is and the demonstration of his love for us. That his death on the cross is the supreme example of what it means when it says God is love. This is the demonstration of how much God loves us that he would give himself for us. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you've seen me, when Doubting Thomas is like questioning him and not believing that Jesus had uh, come back to life, he's like questioning and doubting. And Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so in Jesus, we have this picture of what perfect love and who God is. And so as we come to the table, just remember that, be mindful of that, that God is love and his demonstration of how much he loves you is he's willing to go to the full extent to give himself for you. And so let me pray. We'll sing together and we'll uh, have communion here together. So God, thanks for moments and conversations and study. And we, man, especially on this topic, admit that we just fall short. I am not a theologian. Uh, I have trouble at times grasping some of these concepts. And so we've done our best here as reunion family and friends just to open our minds and our hearts to who you are, God. And maybe if nothing else, we catch a glimpse of how huge and big and mysterious you are. And that leaves us in awe and wonder it makes us realize how special it is that the God who is called all things, the God who was and is and is to come, cares about each of us and desires relationship and that you love us. The love that you have for us comes from your very essence of who you are. And maybe that's the reminder we need to know that there is a God who loves us. And you demonstrated your love for us by giving your life. And so Jesus, we celebrate and thank you for that. We come around the table, we take these elements to remind us of your broken body and shed blood, and we celebrate that as a church, we steward this message of hope and identity of what it means to be in relationship with a God who loves us. We sing this song, changing some lyrics as a way of expanding our mind and thinking. Lead us as we sing and as we come to the table.